Welcome to Our Mayor's Podcast. Our Mayor is breaking it down. Welcome, Van Johnson, the yeah, mayor yeah. of the great city of Savannah, to the podcast again. Thank you for being my co-host. It's great to be back, and um, you know, I guess I did something right. So of course, it's it easy great too. space with the executive director of the Great African American Mayors Association, the Phyllis Dickerson. Thank you, Mayor Johnson. And so today we have with us Milton Pratt from Michael's organization. Welcome, uh, Milton, to the conversation. Thanks for having me. I look forward to a, a spirited conversation about the work that we do across the country. So, Milton, you know, when most of us talk about Michael's, we think of arts and crafts. Yeah. So what is Michael's organization exactly? Explain it to our listening audience. Yeah, no, no. I, I get that all the time. If I have a hat on, somebody says, oh, you work for Michael's, the arts and crafts. And no, no, no. We're Michael's, the real estate developer. Uh, Michael's is a privately held national real estate developer. We primarily develop rental housing. We work in 39 states. Uh, we have about 600 communities. We take care of about, most importantly, about 300,000 uh, people across this country. The type of rental housing we develop is just about every type you can imagine. Affordable, attainable housing, student housing, military housing, and market rate housing. We like to think of ourselves as a problem solver developer, especially when we're developing affordable housing and attainable housing, because we know there's a crisis here in the country. And we like to be able to create that type of housing to support cities and communities. Well, well, as we get started, I think it's important because you've mentioned different types of housing. And I've always gotten caught up, and I know my citizens do, on the definitions of affordable, attainable, workforce, you know, student, military. Um, some are more obvious than others. Why don't you give us some definitions of when we're, we you know, the base, what we're talking about today? Well, I like to describe it as if I'm talking to my grandma, because that's that's a good way to, to make people understand it. So affordable housing is for families. I'll give you the technical definition. It's for families that are below 60 percent area median income. Typically, that's financed with tax credits, Section 8, community development block grant funding. Those projects are projects. Those, those communities are communities where people that are uh, work, work in shops in the retail industry, uh, work, work at uh, hospitals, maybe work in uh, manufacturing, like so lower income families. And then attainable housing is the piece that many people get confused with. You know, they call it different things. They call it attainable housing. They call it the missing middle or they, they call it workforce housing. But those are people like policemen, firemen, uh, nurses. Those are the people that would typically live there. And the rents are between 80 and 120 percent AMI. The missing middle or attainable housing that's the piece that most cities don't have a full-fledged program for. They're still trying to figure out how do we make sure our policemen and firemen and nurses can live in the communities that they work in. Well, I, I didn't ever think about, you know, the different definitions and categories, and I think most people don't. So why is this conversation so important at this moment in time? Well, the attainable housing conversation is so vitally important because as communities are trying to grow and achieve greater economic development, they need to be able to recruit and retain the best people into their city or keep the best people in the city. So I'll use an example of a hospital. A hospital you know, has a lot of, lot of types of employees that work there, but let's just take a nurse. If a nurse is working at a hospital and she's making $75,000 a year, $80,000 a year, a young person out of college. In many cities, she or he would not be able to even afford a uh, rental home in the community. They'd be forced to commute an hour, hour and a half outside the city. Now, I don't know about you, but I want my nurse to be fresh when she gets to work or he gets to work at 7 a.m. And so the way to improve this is to have them live closer to their campus. And that's where the attainable housing comes into play, making certain that nurses, firemen, police officers and teachers have places to live that are in the communities that they live, work and play in. Well, I know that mayors are often quite limited sometimes when it comes to issues of housing, uh, depending on the state. But what things can mayors do to help to encourage the development of affordable and obtainable housing? That's a great question, Mayor. And I will tell you, providing the leadership that's necessary to say to their housing and community development staff, this is a high priority for me. 
every time I see a new mayor get elected, I'm always sitting around waiting to hear them talk about the goal that they're going to set for different types of housing. I don't often hear a goal when it comes to workforce housing. I hear talk about it, but provide the elect the uh, executive leadership that's necessary to direct the staff is probably the most important thing. Making it front of mind in the mayor's administration is also important, meaning you talk about it. You reach out to employers. You get employers like hospitals to be a part of the solution to creating attainable housing. So, Milton, I know we had a conversation before about attainable and affordable housing and that kind of thing. As a former mayor's chief of staff, um, you know, I have a passion for home ownership. Right. And so where does this lead? Like, in other words, is there a a process where people literally transition from, quote, rentable rent houses and that kind of thing um, over to home ownership? Do you guys have a process there? Is is there a home ownership piece to this? Um, We're not a home ownership developer, but to some extent, there is a home ownership piece. Let me tell you how. So if you're a, you know, a, a nurse and a teacher, husband and wife live together, and if you are paying market rate rent in your community, your rent might be, I'll make up the number, $2,000 a month. So that might be 45 or 50% of your income. You're not able to even save for a new home if you're putting out $2,000 a month rent. But with workforce housing, your rent might only be 14 or let's say $1,600. That will allow you to save $400 towards buying a new home at some point. So it isn't a formal program, but by having rent that's less than the market rate rent in attainable housing, you'd be able to you know, build a little reserve, save for a home, save for your kid's college education, whatever it is you're focused on, you, you'd be able to do that. Well, in many communities, you see where the markets are on fire. And so there is a thought that the market should play itself out. But as you said, it leaves a lot of people uh, out of those opportunities to live the American dream. Um, what advice would you give uh, to those communities that are, you know, in the mix of the market plus creating opportunities for people to to have a place to live that's close to where they work? I, I would say be creative and talk to many developers and talk to many community leaders about what their goals are. Uh, Find ways to repurpose existing assets in the communities. For instance, you might consider taking a fire station and building affordable housing or workforce housing on top of a fire station, on top of a library to reduce the land costs to make these projects more financially feasible. Uh, You could also Think about how you would work with your school district to help them repurpose old school buildings. Again, if you can lower the cost of the overall development by providing land at nominal or no cost through one of many government entities, whether it's a housing authority, a redevelopment authority, school district, that's an opportunity to create attainable or affordable housing. So what role does the employer have in this whole attainable housing conversation? What role do they play in this? Uh, A very critical role. Uh, I spend my time talking to a a significant number of CEOs of hospitals these days. And I always start out with, I know you as a CEO at a hospital, you have a problem. It's a recruitment and retention problem. We talked about that earlier. That problem is something that I can help you. I can help solve for you. I can work with you. Let's say a, a hospital has excess land, a large parking lot. Let's use that as an example. And it's underutilized for whatever reason. Or they have a old hospital building that they're trying to figure out how to repurpose it. They could contribute that land as an investment into a attainable housing project. That would lower the cost of the development. So let's make it up. If the development, the entire community costs $50 million, if you reduce the cost of the land by providing it at low cost, let's say that's six or $7 million, all of a sudden, that means that the development only costs $46 million or $44 million, which will allow us to lower the rents because we don't have to borrow more money for the land. And the employer, what they need to do is allow us as a developer to have access to their employee base, to market to them, to get them to live in our community. And every one of these 
uh, uh, deals that we do in the attainable space is completely different. They're all like snowflakes. So we will work with a school district, we'll work with a uh, hospital system, or we'll just work with a large manufacturing company to develop a housing community that meets their specific needs. As an example, Mayor, I know in, in your town, your school district has a recruitment challenge because I remember talking to some of them over the years and they bring in a number of uh, school teachers from various parts of the world. And when they bring those teachers in, those teachers need a place to live. And right. so we could develop a community that has all one and two bathroom units that is at a rate that a rental rate that is affordable based on the teacher salary. I think it's interesting you mentioned that. And I want to go back to that for a moment. Um, the price of developing is the price of developing. Um, no developer gets into the business to lose money and you can't lose money. Um, and I wanted to, to highlight the importance of uh, tax credits and other types of incentives that governments, city, state governments can offer to make the development affordable so that, you know, you're able to to build a project. Yeah. So in, in the attainable space, I'll tell you the other thing that makes the deals work is to get a real estate tax exemption. In a number of communities and states, um, you have a real estate tax exemption as of right for families that are living in workforce housing. Uh, most communities have some type of uh, real estate tax exemption for all the uh, uh, affordable housing that you would typically see getting built. But creating attainable housing, you're right, Mayor, you could enact a attainable housing bill that gives you a 75%, 50% reduction in the real estate taxes. By doing that, that lowers the cost of operations, that effectively lowers the cost of rent. And if we were to develop on, say, a repurposed school that you had in your community, all of a sudden we get real estate taxes exempted and we get low cost uh, land. That makes an attainable housing project financially feasible. So those are the types of creative things that local mayors have within their control, as opposed to worrying about, is there a nine or 4% tax credit that they can use? You got to compete with everybody else in your state. The, the fact that we're not looking for tax credits, we're looking for tax exemption, which is locally controlled, and we're looking for low cost land to make these projects financially feasible. So... You know, Milton, first, thank you for being on our business council and the support uh, of Irma. But the question I have is what types of cities are, quote, the perfect city? Are you looking at small cities, mid-sized cities, large cities? Like, what's the perfect city that you're looking for when you're, when you're doing these projects? I would tell you it isn't a perfect city. It's a perfect community, even a sub-market within a community. Uh, attainable housing works best in neighborhoods where rents are already high. So if, if I don't know the city of Savannah well, but if I were in Savannah, I want to be in places that have shops, restaurants, good school systems, because that's where you want people to live. Uh, that's where people want to live, I should say. And that's where you can, you can visit, though, you know, that, right? You just go out and visit, right? <laughs> I've been I've been to Savannah a few times, a lovely <laughs> town. So Savannah is a great example because the population is increasing. You've got a thriving tourist industry. You've got the, the, the kids there at Savannah School of Art and Design, I believe. And so that, that's all pressure on the rental market. So rents have probably gone up over the last five or six years, higher than what you would probably see in other parts of the country. So Savannah would be a great place to develop that type of housing. Same thing goes for some parts of rural America where there, there simply isn't enough attainable housing there. So let's say there is a large manufacturing plant that's coming into a community and they're bringing in a few thousand jobs. You know, there's not enough housing for five or six thousand jobs in a lot of communities. So that's another good place to work with an employer if it's a truck manufacturer facility or if it's a semiconductor manufacturing plant. All those jobs that are coming in, they're going to make more money than uh, they're, they're not going to have enough money. That, sorry. They're not going to be able to live in what we traditionally call affordable housing because they make too much money. And then they might be paying about 50 percent of their income towards market rate housing. So how do we make it work for them? That's that missing middle that workforce, that attainable housing space. Well, I know you have the opportunity to uh, see the entire forest. 
Uh, you see all of these cities. How significant, in your opinion, is the housing crisis and what sets Michaels apart uh, from other developers in this space? Well, we, we have a rich history of working across, again, many platforms in the rental space. We've been here for 50 years. We're privately held. And the thing that makes a difference for us is we're always trying to lift lives. Um, we're always trying to change not, not just house families, but we're trying to change their lives. So we, we work in communities where we have always had a philosophy that we're going to give back to the community. So we have a very, very large scholarship fund every year. Uh, Mike and Pat Levitt, our, our founders, they, they are very generous and they work with executives like myself to go out and raise capital every year. And for every dollar that we raise, Mike and Pat donate uh, two to one. So we give out we give out scholarships in all the communities that we live, work, and play in. So as an example, um, we've given out scholarships in Sarasota, in Tampa, in Philadelphia, in Chicago, in Los Angeles. And we've also given out scholarships to soldiers and sailors kids across the country as well, in Fort Leavenworth, in Benning, in McDill. Uh, and so we think that's one of the things that separates us is that we're going to reinvest in the communities through education and help continue to lift lives. And, you know, it, it's not something that we we just talk about. We really do it every single year. And we've given out millions of dollars over the last 20 years. Wow. So there are a lot of alma mayors listening to this today um, that will be listening to it actually later. But um, if they wanted to get in contact with you or figure out if they're a good fit um, for your organization also, uh, what is the process? Do they just pick up the phone and call you and say, Milton, I want you to come to my city and do some affordable housing or attainable housing? How, do, how does it work? Great question. Uh, it works just by calling me. I mean, I, I spend a lot of my time. I'm always at you know, your conference these days and I go to a number of other conferences and I meet mayors and elected officials and I give them my car and I say, I'm here to help. We want to help you create more attainable and more affordable housing in your community. Uh, we'll bring the things that we've learned nationally by working in large cities and small cities. We'll bring them to Savannah. I know someone on my staff met with your housing staff mayor a few months ago. We'll, we'll, we'll come back down and spend some time and, and we'll, we'll strategize and game plan with you what resources you have available and how we can best help you create attainable and affordable housing. Well, I just wanted to thank you for serving on our business council. Uh, I can't tell you how valuable it is for mayors uh, who are expected to know everything, but we really don't. Um, but to have that onboard expertise uh, in a variety of fields, um, being there to be a resource for us. Um, and I think that's just very, very helpful. As you say, you spend a lot of time with us and around us. And I can't tell you how valuable it is uh, to us um, just to have you there to help keep our um, our mind on the ball, on the main thing, and help provide us valuable resources and information. So Milton, as we start to wind down this conversation, we always want to get to know a little bit about the person that we're interviewing. So tell us a little bit about yourself and how did you actually get into this business? I started out wanting to be a school teacher. <laughs> I, I did. I started out wanting to be a school teacher with the Westchester University uh, in Pennsylvania, got involved in planning, went to work for a planning department in Norristown, Pennsylvania, and I stayed focused on housing, worked for a couple of housing authorities, <laughs> Excuse me. worked for a few housing authorities over the years, and was fortunate enough to have been appointed as regional administrator for HUD in the Mid-Atlantic. And I've been at Michael's almost 20 years. So it's really all I know is housing. It's all I want to know. And uh, I'm happy to be a part of uh, AMA's uh, council. I'm happy to participate in your programs. And I'm always interested in talking to mayors, elected officials about the work that I've dedicated my life to. So would love to come to any town and get on the phone or get on the Zoom or come to town and visit and, and talk about attainable housing. But you said you wanted to be a teacher, but now you're able to help teachers. I, I, I am able to help teachers. So it, it really is something that uh, I enjoy. And, and in a lot of ways, I also participate in a number of mentor programs for developers, minority BIPOC developers that are looking to get into this space. And I participated in a number of programs over the years that I think have been very fruitful 
in training the next group of BIPOC developers to rise to the same heights as I am. So thank you, Lulzi, for joining us today to our mayor's Breaking It Down. Thank you for being part of our business council and the amazing scholarships that you give um, students to give them another opportunity. So if you ever want to uh, present those scholarships from Alma Mayor Cities at our, at our conference, let's talk about that. We think we can find a space for you to give some of those scholarships to HBCU students. I'm sure we can. I'm and sure he see you grad, so I'm that's right. sure he wants to uh, do that to some student at Savannah State. So thank you again for joining us to our mayor's breaking it down, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you for having me, Mayor and Phyllis. Thank you. Thank you.